go. It's a go. Um, unfortunately, hello everyone. Uh, people are joining in. So we're going to take five minutes of break. We'll give uh, people enough time to, you know, gather around. Um, meanwhile, um, I will not entertain you with anything. <laughs> we're just going to wait, go and uh, uh, take a shush, uh, get a cigar, get a smoke, get a coffee. Um, and we'll be here in five minutes. Let me show you what the subject of today will be. Uh, and of course, uh, first new, right. First uh, steps in audio. All right, so we're gonna, we're just gonna leave uh, this five more minutes because I literally have to go with the blue. Ne-am mutat în sala asta și mai este ceva în sala mare și în sala aceasta nu are... Dar ne-ai încercat în urmă la un primul fund este care avea în urmă la un primul fund. În momentul ce noi ne-am pătărut la subiectul ăsta, noi, voi, alu, la subiectul ăsta cu două zile de mai pe mine, la cu două zile. Am văzut ce mai știu la poate din scurt, dacă îi zic că la lăsat bine, dacă nu, asta e o să-i scot din lumea din altul tăi. Dar nu pot să fie o să fie o să fie o să fie o să fie.
Okay. Uh, now that we've solved every problem, and it's probably no, oh, still have a minute, but we're going to start anyway. Let me just wet my throat a bit. How many? How many people do we have on the on the stream? Three. Okay. Hi. The three people on the stream. Glad you've <laughs> uh, glad you've gathered here because you're in for a treat. Um, what we're going to talk today, uh, I think, is very clear uh, what the subject is. Um, and another guest is entering the room and choosing a position. Thank you. Um, so, first steps in music production. Um, I've, I've chosen this name because literally you have to make some steps to get there. You can't just, you know, bump into music production like you open paint and start painting. There are some, you know, production basics and concepts that you need to be uh, acquainted for uh, with before actually getting in because it is. Uh, a domain of itself uh, and involves uh, using a certain um, type of tools, a certain type of um, you know flow, and um, it's it's its own uh, you know uh, domain. Um, without further ado, let me uh, step back a bit and introduce myself. Um, aside from the obvious name, which is written on the screen. Um, you can call me Alex. Um, um, well, a lot of you people who came here already uh, have seen this, uh, but I'm going to go very fast through this. I'm um, uh, developing a brand called Fragnite Games that's focused uh, on uh, producing games on PCs and uh, consoles. Um, Destiny Squirrel, which is uh, focused on mobile devices and a technology provider uh, slash asset store publisher. So any technology that would be developed for Destiny Squirrel or Fragment Games will be submitted on the asset store under the name, uh, under the publisher name Omnisar Technologies. So uh, by the way, go on the asset store and uh, get that timer. It's uh, the FPS timer is free. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I have another passion, uh, and it's a passion that I share with my brother here, uh, Andrew Tadran. <laughs> um, the passion is obviously music production, and we do this since we were kids, basically. <laughs> and I remember my first track was in 2000 and no, 1999 on a, on a program called um, Rebirth. It uh, wasn't very advanced, but, you know, it gave us an insight in how music would be created. As a music producer, I'm known as Future Sound, um, on which I've released uh, among the years um, trends, um, trends tracks. Um, Armada um, Music was my biggest um, label to be signed on. Um, obviously, uh, being signed with Armin von Buren, Brought a lot of exposure and things went really well from that uh, from that point on. Um, this track uh, called uh, "Come to Me" made it to um, the, the yes on the on the compilation uh, "State of Trance," but also uh, went into um, 1,000 uh, trance uh, tracks of all times on. Uh, Almost on the last position, but imagine there are millions of trans productions. So, uh, Nova is a project. It's a very old project. It was uh, started in 2001, stopped in 2006, and it was ambiental, future sound, obviously trans. Society of Exile is mostly on the bass uh, styles, like the neurofunk, uh, drum and bass, dubstep, uh, even movie production. So, if you're uh, eager to uh, know what my work was in the future, I invite you to just look up on YouTube for Future Sound. You'll see a lot of uh, videos uploaded by many people. Um, so, uh, 
the thing is that music production itself extends beyond the you know necessity consumption of um, normal people uh, we actually need it in game development um, because you know games have sound and usually if a game involves a certain story um, bringing music uh, to it helps uh, you know putting that story to frame that story a, a, a bit better um, unfortunately it's uh, very often overlooked and um, unless you're a very, very, very big studio, uh, you know, and you have a lot, you, you have a contract with a very, you know, very big uh, top producer, uh, and you sign a contract for an original soundtrack, OST, uh, for exclusive for um, uh, for your game, you're more likely to be left in a kind of a dead zone where you have to find guys that produce music but at the same time you know they do produce music they do it at a certain level some some are good some are bad uh, some are cheap some are expensive um, some they will just sell music on the asset store but then you think oh, if I buy this you know collection of tracks maybe someone else will also buy it so where's my originality here um, so if you dare to step into music production yourself, um, you'll save yourself a lot of cash because, uh, and I was surprised to find out that um, a good, a good uh, producer can, um, you know, can um, call for $500 per half a minute of production. So, <laughs> so that's quite expensive, but it means you're, you have to deliver a, very high quality stuff. We mean, I mean, uh, you know, big names like Bethesda or EA Sports with their games. Um, but yeah, these are uh, these are the numbers and, and the facts. So there is um, an obvious need for music in the game industry, but at the same time, there's not much offer, and people are left with some options that are not really good. Um, are not really good, you know, uh, from uh, from their standpoint, um, and they choose to either not have music or have music that is not exactly cohesive. Maybe he got a track from a guy, a track from another guy, or he got him from asset store, and it's not a cohesive cohesive style. And um, you'll see what I what I mean in a minute. Every producer has, you know, a pattern, some sort of a signature of its uh, of its own. It has some you can almost tell who produced what. Um, and, you know, sometimes this is a good thing, sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, maybe someone will look for you just because you have a certain style uh, that you, uh, you know, put into your music and they want exactly that style. Um, some others may prefer something more neutral, like, well, you know, I, we know you like synths and bass and a lot of stuff, but, you know, we would like some just opera music, <laughs> so just a symphony. Uh, so don't, don't get uh, very, um, you know, personal and focused with what you normally do. Um, and I'm talking with the, with the wise and uh, let's talk uh, with the house. Um, I hope I can flip back and forth between the, uh, the presentation and the software we're going to use so that you make sense of the concepts right away instead of just, you know, accumulating a bunch of information and then, ah, that was a domain, ah, that was an instrument. Uh, and no, we cannot do that. Oh, I think we can, actually, yes. Uh, it's a different, um, yep, very well. Um, this is FL Studio. Um, it's a very old version. It's FL Studio 9.0 XXL producer, producer version, blah, blah. Um, the, 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 last, uh, the latest FL Studio is, I think, 2020. But at the core, it's the same. And the principles are all the same. What you will get with uh, uh, a new version of FL Studio is you know you'll get more many more uh, built-in plugins um, some 
design features that will help you do things a little easier. But I thought, you know, let's start with some basic stuff. Uh, and then uh, maybe some other times we'll jump into a more complex environment. Uh, I'm pretty sure that for a lot of you, if you're not familiar with music production, this already looks like a, the cockpit of a, of a jet plane. <laughs> but, um, and I haven't even uh, opened uh, synthesizers and everything else. So let me clear this out by, you know, pressing all these. Okay. So this is FL Studio naked, no window on. But um, to give you just a bit of a presentation, um, this is obviously play, stop button. We can switch between playing the song or playing a certain pattern that we're working on. Let's say your song has a bass line, has uh, some drum, some drums, like kicks, snares, hi-hats, and all that kind of stuff. And it has some um, keys, or may maybe a piano or something. And you would like to uh, address them individually at first to, you know, um, make sure you're you're hearing only that part you're focusing on uh, to make sure you, you're getting the, 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 the sound that you're actually after. And uh, when you're happy, you will paint, you will drop those patterns on a playlist, um, which is this, just like that. This is a pattern, it's another pattern, and you form an arrangement, right? Um, but before we go into a playlist, let's um, get us acquainted with what's here. Don't care about what's here. All you need to focus is this button, and this, which plays the, the pattern or the song. Um, also, you will need to be familiar with, obviously, Open, which will open a project, an F FLP project. Um, you know, it already tells you uh, that Do you want to say this. This is the FLP is the standard, um, is the actual FL Studio, um, you know, extension for projects. So this is the project file. Um, um, you can export to a WAV file, to an MP3. So obviously you will export after you've done your, your project, you've done your composition, you've done uh, all your instruments, and you say, okay, sounds good, now I want to render and import it maybe into my game or whatever, send it to Armada Music. <laughs> um, and channels, because uh, we are going to add lots of instruments, and essentially an, um, an instrument, <clears throat> Um, all the instruments that you are going to work with will be listed here in the, I don't know how this is called, window. Uh, channel is channel the channel rack. Um, and please don't confuse the channel rack, which imagine that you have a band with four guys. One is um, uh, the lead singer, one has a guitar, one has a bass guitar, and another one has a uh, a drum uh, has all the drums. Um, they will be represented here by just one instance, or maybe more, who knows. But these are essentially <clears throat> elements that um, once fed into MIDI uh, data, uh, they will produce sounds. And I think we have to flip back to the, uh, to the presentation. So that we get a bit acquainted with the concept, aside from what we have seen already in FL Studio. Because if I start talking about FL Studio now, you will miss a lot of concepts, and I will say, uh, you know, an instrument, or I'll say a uh, MIDI, and you would not know what that is. Uh, so let's go very, very fast uh, through all this uh, information. Now, what you have seen is FL Studio, but obviously it's not the only one. Uh, it's just the one I am, I am using. Uh, also, there's Personas, uh, there's Studio One from Personas, Sonar, Ableton Live is very popular uh, because it's uh, also oriented on live mixing. So, um, Reason uh, is another very popular but a bit oldish uh, thing. Pro, Pro Tools is kind of an industry standard. Uh, probably 50% of the tracks you have heard in your life were made in Pro Tools. GarageBand is, it's a bit, 
mm, mediocre, but I've included it here anyway. It doesn't allow you a lot of control, but it's very easy to use. So if you're really, really, really starting to get into music production, you could start with Garage, Garage Band, but I strongly suggest you would start with FL Studio because you'll see how flexible and how much uh, control you get uh, and how many things you get to do with it. Um, Logic X is uh, another one. Cubase, created by Steinberg, is another big uh, name in the, in the game. Uh, Steinberg being the company that actually created the VSD um, standard, which is the standard uh, format for plugins. Uh, be it a sound processor plugin or an instrument plugin, case in which it will be called a VSDI. We'll see this on a new slide. Uh, but uh, we are going to use FL Studio, and this is the ID of music production. So if you're a software developer, you have an ID. <clears throat> so you do everything there. You write, you compile, you debug, you do all the stuff. Um, this is a digital audio workstation. So all these here that I've listed, they are all DAWs, and they, we will refer to them as being DAWs. Uh, obviously, between us, we will call them programs to create music, but uh, you know, uh, the industry calls them DAW from digital audio workstation, um, an instrument. Now, we are used to um, associate this uh, name with an actual physical instrument. Like you hear, oh, someone is playing an instrument. You never think of a synthesizer or a, you know, a MIDI pattern or a sampler or something like that. You think of a guitar, you think of a piano. But uh, in the world of digital music production, uh, we have to work somehow in a virtual environment. So we have to make use of virtual instruments. Even if some of those virtual instruments are connected to an actual physical hardware instrument, like you will see a lot of uh, producers, especially the, the ones that are very, very old, uh, not old, they are very, uh, you know, um, old in the industry, let's say. Uh, often you will see behind them a rack of a lot of things. Those are either uh, sound processor units or they are, um, real instruments, uh, physical synthesizers, analogic synthesizers, and they would connect that to, to, a, to an audio interface and they will have control from the door uh, to, that, um, to that physical uh, instrument. Regardless of how you uh, choose to get your instrument in the door, you'll end up with some sort of graphical interface. For instance, I'm going to remove this because this is not an instrument. Um, <clears throat> although it shows up here, is a special type of instrument. Um, a, an instrument would be probably FL keys. So this is a synthesizer. That is a simple DLL that Unity offers off the shelf so that you don't start with basically absolutely nothing. So it gives you a, a start. It gives you some synthesizers that you can make stuff with it. For instance, FL keys. Uh, we can choose what kind of piano uh, to, and I've completely closed this uh, volume, let's see. Right, sounds like a piano. You can even make harmonies, like... Okay, it sounds very dry because that's the purpose of synthesizer. Uh, it sounds dry, I mean, it doesn't have reverb, echo, this is something you will add later on because you want to control how much reverb you want to have. It would not be very uh, flexible uh, to have a piano that has a reverb and you cannot take it off, right? Maybe you have a track where you need a drier piano or you want to distort the piano to the point where it doesn't sound like a piano, it sounds like something else and try to distort the sound that already has reverb in it. It will only get a big mess. Uh, but I promise if we add a, um, a reverb to this piano, it will sound so much better. Um, and since we've introduced the concept of an instrument, uh, let's also introduce the concept of the mixer, which is on a different slide. I think it's the last one. Um, but we're going to go back and forth between the concepts uh, because I think it's uh, more practical to show you, you know, an actual flow here. Uh, so I've created an instrument, and the instrument has some properties. It has a keyboard, 
which you can click on it um, just to hear how the instrument sounds. But also FL Studio is very... Two seconds, we were uh, one, two, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we we're saying about an instrument. Let's add another instrument just to have a, you know, have a reference and have a comparison. I will put a something that is purely a synthesizer, the Wasp. Um, um, I personally use it, so uh, by default, it sounds very, very raw. You wouldn't think that something you would use, but um, it's very versatile, especially if you have worked on some uh, presets and you have programmed these things. You could almost lose an entire day programming uh, uh, an, a synthesizer, especially if it's a complex one, just to get that uh, that uh, that sound that you're after. For instance, uh, I call this badass ride, uh, Mad DNB baseline. Okay. Um, we need to go a um, few octaves lower. Right, so same synthesizer, different sound, just because I mess around with uh, things here. Um, so we have a very nice piano, we have another synthesizer, but this is actually make you start from very, very scratch. Maybe you need Maybe you need, a, as a beginner, maybe you need a, a head start um, that is a bit more convenient than just, you know, staying and programming your own instruments from scratch. Maybe, you know, instruments, they can be very intimidating. Uh, if you think this one has too many buttons, um, I don't have the citrus. Oh, yes. Where is the citrus? Second. Yeah. Citrus is horrific. You have all these parameters. You have all these filter combinations. You have a lot of stuff to work on. And it's just so, so complicated. Fortunately for you, um, most of the plugins will come with uh, presets. So you don't have to, so you can start from something instead of just start from, you know, flat default and build your way up. <clears throat> and holy moly, a lot of presets. <laughs> so you would you would think that, hey, I can make an entire track only with citrus. And it would probably be true. Um, Acid. Um, another preset. Uh, I'm looking for uh, a pad. Where, where, where do we have the pads? Beep, 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 beep. Piano, percussion, plucked. Lefty, lefty. That one, these are pads above clouds. Okay, so these are very powerful instruments. I mean, think about it this way. Um, if and, well, obviously music production didn't start on computers. It started somewhere in the studio, in an actual studio with microphones placed on as close as possible to each instrument. Um, the, the person that would play the actual instrument would, uh, re would, uh, would play it. Uh, performance would have to be recorded and then mixed with all other tracks that uh, you know the song would have to be made of. Um, but think about it this way: uh, most of the time, they would record this at the same time. They would have microphones on their own instruments, and the voice would be uh, placed somewhere else so that sound from other instruments would not um, conflict with uh, the sound with your microphone. So essentially, you would hear only yourself in the microphone. Uh, they would have separate rooms regardless. And sometimes they would actually record this live. So they would say, hey, three, two, one, go. Boom. And somebody would actually mix uh, uh, and balance the, the, the track uh, in real time. And think about it this way. Uh, it, it's all done, and now the guy with guitar hits a wrong note. 
what do you have to do? Well, either play back all the record, all the other tracks, and put this guy alone and fix his error. But it's an obviously a tedious process. Who wants to get the guitar again, go back to the play essentially the whole track until you get the right uh, thing? Um, in the digital world, um, having a piano that you know is programmable um, from a MIDI standpoint, uh, that means you can write your notes on a board and you can play that as many times as you want. Uh, you can record this performance of piano uh, into an, uh, an actual track and if you've missed one note, you just take the note and move it downwards and you fix your error. So having a non-destructive way of working is obviously a very, very, very big um, uh, convenient uh, for us. So, in fact, most of the stuff you will do in a in FL Studio will be non-destructive. What do I mean? That, what do I mean by that? So, um, if we take if we take a piece of audio and let me see if I have one that my reach. Um, yeah, I think this is um, Deepish mode. Enjoy the silence. Um, for instance, if I take this part here. And now I go and add some reverb that I don't have on the computer. <laughs> but let's let's assume I do something with it. You know, I, I put a delay, an echo, multi-tap, uh, chorus, large hall four, whatever. Um, and I save this file. Can I repeat the process? No. Uh, I don't even have markers. How, how much, do, let's say I save this to a new file, but I have to go back to the original file and try to guess the exact position that I selected and redo the, uh, the effect. This is called destructive editing, like in Photoshop. Instead of actually adding layers and you know paint on those additional layers, you paint on, on the actual image. That is destructive editing, because once you've edited that, the only way of actually going back is through Control Z, and that's not uh, that's not productive. Um, in FL Studio, everything is pretty much uh, non-destructive, um, aside from the outside uh, samples that you bring into the actual DAW. And I mentioned uh, earlier the fact that you don't have to start. Uh, you know, from scratch, programming synthesizers and do all that things, uh, do all those things. You can actually make use of pre-rendered samples. And in the world of production, uh, they are actually used, especially the drums. Um, because trust me, programming um, a drum uh, that would sound realistically on a synthesizer, even if it's a drum-related synthesizer, it's a hard thing to do, and it does make sense. There are tons and tons of pre-recorded uh, drums that you can actually use. So it doesn't make sense to, you know, start synthesizing drums. So you would make use of external uh, external sounds that you bring into your door, not necessarily into your project, but in your door. Think about it like a sound database that you have at your disposal that you can choose from, right? And that sound database, uh, the only thing I, I've done, so it's an actual folder on my hard drive. Yeah, so we have uh, my computer, we have D. I've chosen to put it in the root of D because they get to be very uh, nested in directories and you'll hit the maximum 266, I think, character characters. And the, the names are long usually, so try to make it short because you will end up with Explorer, well, uh, you know, hard drive-based problems. So in here I have acapellas, which are vocals, essentially. Um, for instance, a cappellas from um, Calvis Harris, David Guetta, Devish Mode, Gwen Stephanie, Ellie Golding, Madonna. No. <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> no, it's, 
It's, it's the other way around. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's right. Oh my God. <laughs> no, the other way around. I mean. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's a bit of a mess here. The sun is. Uh, I just leave it like that. I think it's it's it's, it's actually. <laughs> What's the what's the clock? Okay, we have uh, we have burned a half an hour, um, and obviously when you're dealing with a lot of samples, you have to be organized. Now, for the sake of this presentation, I wasn't very organized. Uh, however, I did put the acapellas in a single folder folder acapellas, and we have hip hop acapellas. Um, some guy's a cappella that I can't reach. I made a remix of his a cappella, <laughs> and he's like, he's like dead. He's nowhere to be found. Uh, I have other some a cappellas that I really, really like for the quality of the vocals, and these top artists that maybe someday I will make a remix, remix of them. Uh, already done a remix for the Ocean Lab fit uh, just in season. My love is like footsteps in the snow. You see, it's the dry acapella. So you can, you have a lot of power when you have a dry uh, dry sound. You can you can you can do a lot of stuff with it. Um, but then, what else do we have? Uh, obviously, a lot of folders with with samples. Um, I've chosen what I thought to be useful for today's presentation. Obviously, we're not going to go through all this. Uh, we're just going to use what's convenient for us. Um, but um, among, sample, among samples, we, can, we could have, for instance, um, a collection of types of instruments, like bass drums, if you go in here, you have clubby bass drums, you have distorted day bass drums, punchy, sub, trancy. Let's get the trancy. And you have a lot and lots of, lots of uh, variations on um, basically what is called a kick. Um, but there's no point in actually going through Explorer because, you see, I, I, I took all this, um, this uh, path. And I told FL Studio, you know, I'd like this to be considered as my, uh, you know, as my assets folder, if you wish. You go to file settings, you just drop it in there, bam, you have it in here. And why is better to have it in here? Uh, well, first of all, it's more convenient to just drag and drop sounds. Um, and secondly, uh, you get to, to actually play them by just clicking them. So instead of double click, close, double click, close, you just go uh, through every, let's say, let's take the kick. Um, I can't see, okay, clubby kicks. Okay. Lots of oh, clubby kicks. So it's actually easier for you to understand what, what you're after. What, 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 what kind of track do I need? Do I need a track that I need a punchy kick? Do I need, do I need in my track uh, the kick to be maybe a little lower? Maybe I'm doing a hip hop style uh, type of kick. You get your options. So instead of creating the kick uh, with a synthesizer, although you can do that with Fruity Kick, it's a synthesizer uh, meant to do just one thing. Oh, the crash during a presentation. Thank you, FL Studio. Very nice of you. Um, usually what I do, I go, I change the root note to be C9 instead of, all the synthesizers will start, will have the root note at C5. That's kind of, when, sorry? Yes, that, that would be the, the base, um, let's say, note. Uh, when you press Q or C on a on an actual keyboard, uh, and that's one one of the uh, nice things about FL Studio, uh, I forgot to mention, it has an incorporated MIDI keyboard, so you don't have to come and plug in uh, an actual physical controller. Yeah, yeah, controller, but they are also called MIDI keyboard. Uh, my brother uh, 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 offered me to you know bring one, and I said you know I don't want to send the wrong message here that you have to spend a lot of money to make music. I want to prove everyone that you can do it with just a computer and a pair of studio monitors um, and a mouse. Uh, so um, 
think about it uh, like that. Uh, you don't have that physical keyboard, but FL Studio allows you to open your uh, any plugin you have, and once you click, for instance, I click the Q, you see, it's C, it's the C node. Um, I click who? Now I would have to, I have to, uh, do, do we have a virtual keyboard on, uh, we have a virtual keyboard on Windows, right? Because I want on screen keyboard, because I want to, want people to see it. Um, but I'm afraid we're losing focus on it. So, C, two, two. <laughs> okay. Uh, so C, D sharp, D, uh, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, F, five, oh, yeah, there, okay, D, uh, D sharp, uh, A, um, A sharp, D, uh, and D sharp and C. And once you've reached C, you've essentially looping. So for instance, um, with a kick is not the best, um, the best uh, demonstration. Let's take something more simple to <clears throat> to demonstrate that we don't know we no longer need this we'll make a simple <laughs> not so loud uh, triangle uh, based um, so this would be um, C C5 if I change the root node I play C5 it will actually play uh, C4 Right? If I go up, it will play C6 instead. So this is a good way to actually, you know, go from uh, the middle range to the base range. Usually, what I do, I if I if I think I want to create a baseline, I just instantly go C6 at least. If if not even C7, you've heard on the Mad drum and bass. Uh, here I I went directly to C7, um, and the keyboard um, in FL Studio has two octaves long. It's two octaves long. It starts with Q, W, blah, 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 and it, then it starts with Z, and you have the same uh, arrangement of the keys but with a lower octave. So it's very convenient. For instance, this is C. You see, it's actually the same note, but played on a off frequency. Let's take another one. They have the same. They, they have the same note. They are. They are both the same note. Um, same with the with with, with this. Um, where was the plug again? The three oscillator. Maybe we put a pure sign that we don't hear. I went too far to C seven. It already. You, you can actually tell that it's. You know, it's under. Um, you, well, you hear it, but you'd actually need a subwoofer to hear this. Um, since now you would hear something, I go with C7, you hear a strong bass, I go with C5, and you can go as, as high as you want. Uh, FL Studio allows you to go as low as C9, case in which you would probably use an earthquake if you have a device to play this, or as high as C0, and that would be the root note. And if I play this, I'm going to have to cut the volume down because, yeah, it's uh, it goes up or <laughs> as long as your keyboard allows it. So um, that's a very good thing for, uh, for, a, for a fellow that just wants to experiment with the music but not actually spend a lot of money on hardware. Um, the integrated keyboard in FL Studio is very, very useful to, to see how things sound, you know. And, okay, so what have we uh, covered until now? Let's make, um, we know what a DAW is, we know what an instrument is, ish. So far we've talked about synthesizers, uh, but also there's a special type of instrument called a sampler. And it's a different thing from a sample. Let me show you, let me picture the difference. Um, if, if I close all this mambo jumbo and I open my playlist, this is where you would actually do your arrangement, right? You would create pattern one, let's say, X, 
uh, pattern to uh, name, uh, I don't know, baselines or baseline because maybe you have more baselines. And number three, we'll call uh, keys, you know, and you would start, you know, on the kicks, it's pretty obvious. Uh, you would take a clubby kick, whatever. Okay, I like this one. Uh, you can drop it right in here, case in which it will be played back at C5, like the actual sound, just like that. But if you want to get uh, fancy with it, um, of course, first of all, you can come here and change its root node. So instead of C5, you can make it sometimes. It, it, it helps just to, you see, now you hear a deeper bass than this, to the point where the bass just fades completely. So you have a lot of options. Um, but for, for this kick, I will opt in to just uh, draw just like you would do on a very old sampler. You would have instruments and where you would put this, uh, the the engine would play that instrument, the C5. And actually, I have a version of FL Studio that is, yes, correct, FL Studio 1.5. <laughs> and they had absolutely no way to put the kick on a different different frequency unless you would go here and change the root note. But if you want a kick to be at C5 here and at D5 here, there's, there's no way to do it. Maybe, maybe like, no, this is panning. Uh, yeah, this one. Very, you see, when you play it, But that's not that's not a very well, good way of, of working. And don't don't even uh, <laughs> let me show you how the playlist looks like. Uh, view. Uh, yes, this is the playlist, <laughs> and you have your sample your patterns created here. So you have the first pattern. Actually, uh, last night I was uh, playing with this, and I've created um, a bit of a trancy uh, thing where I have pattern number one, pattern number two, pattern number, th number three, and I would have an arrangement of uh, that looks like this. And notice how the playlist is actually inversed. So time flows down instead of go right. <laughs> and this is the number of, uh, of the pattern. And it sounds like this. Not bad for a thing that was created like Yeah, this is trans. This. Yeah, uh, but I would have made this way much easier in in this software because uh, for once uh, the baseline, I can right click and create a piano roll. And let's choose a baseline here that uh, you know. Let, let's design a bit the baseline, which is definitely not this. Uh, or screw it. Uh, let's take a oh god. Let's take a baseline that we already have uh, magically uh, here. Uh, I will take the electro C two no C electro C baseline, and it sounds like this. It's a bit modern, right? It's a bit more modern too. Or maybe we have to tone, tone it down a little bit. Let's see if we... Oh god, it's already C7, so if I go... It doesn't make any sense. All right. Um, what you can do to actually automate the playback of this instrument, uh, you can actually record a MIDI performance. So you press play. You make sure your baseline is put in the right place, you know, like here. Uh, you kind of extend it so that it doesn't loop around and ruin your performance. And uh, 
make sure you're on the right track here. Um, you make some sort of a rehearsal before, like, let me try. Okay, seems like a normal place time. So now if I press record, um, he will give me the option either to record sound, and this will show up in the playlist as a genuine sound form, sound file, right? Um, as a genuine clip. Um, do I want to record automation and score? Maybe you have a synthesizer that has a cutoff control and you want to start, you know, a little more um, muffled and then open up the synthesizer and you would want that to, to actually be animated over time and you don't have like six hands to do that. Uh, so you create these automation clips that uh, handle a single parameter on a single um, instrument so that you bring some life in your, um, in your, uh, no, in your, yeah, in your performance. We'll see how we do that. But for now, I just want to record some score. Um, score meaning a uh, sequence of keys, just like Mozart's um, <laughs> notes. Um, and he will click four times, indicating that in five, four, three, one, you go. And whatever you record, he will remember as a MIDI uh, recording. As a... So let's do it. See? And stop. And now we have all the notes we have played. And if we play them back, stop the recording. Uh, if we play them, if we play the song back, it, it just plays my awful performance because I'm not a freaking real time playback artist. But don't despair. I only did this because I wanted to show you can do this. Uh, if you're a real life uh, piano performer, you will find it very easy to actually record your performance here and play it with uh, any instrument you would like. Um, so what do I do uh, to actually make this usable? I have the notes. Some of these are wrong. Uh, let's see, where, where did I actually did it wrong, I think? No, they, that's, I think the, these two are, are off the off the grid. Just going to delete them. Um, you can zoom in and zoom out, uh, holding control. Um, let's have an overview of this. We select them all, and we go to Edit, uh, Tools, and you do a quick quantize, case in which he will snap their length and position to the closest uh, position in the grid. Uh, that will give you some sort of advantage because you don't have to take, manually take and hold, you know, alt and get a variable number. It's it's easier to have them on the grid because now you can you can just you know come here, move them, and let's try to make. First of all, let's drop the volume a little bit. I think I. Want to go like this, so you can you can you can actually start a new uh, pattern and just draw the thing if you know what the thing is. Um, uh, in my case, I've put these purely as a reference uh, point. So sometimes I would play the pattern, uh, and I would go like this. Uh, I think we're going too fast. By the way, this is where this is how you change the tempo, the global tempo of the track. See, now it, it goes slower. Yeah, and this is one thing that you can. Holy shit! You can even automate this. It's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't automate the BPM. It's. I know it's tempting to do so because you can have dynamic BPMs. Just stick with a <laughs> just stick with a constant BPM. <laughs> uh, 
I know, but yeah, I know, but since we're actually essentially making a dance track, uh, let's call it like this, uh, we'll use a kind of an industry standard 128 uh, bits per minute. Um, and usually what I would do, uh, just to get a sense of, uh, you either do this, Um, I don't like this flow here, so... Okay, something like this. Uh -huh. So... Once we get the, you know, the cycle uh, of the first, we can basically copy it. Because we know, now we know how the thing looks like. Maybe we should make it shorter, like this, and hope I'm not losing anything here. Delete. I won't. I won't lie. This is a tedious work. So uh, nothing changed. Okay. Make sure you have line selected here. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to to snap to grid. It will snap to nothing, or it will snap to uh, half the grid or quarter the grid or sixth the grid, you would usually want to snap to a, to a whole line. Let's see if uh, what I have in mind works. Promise this will not last very much. Um, okay. Uh, so far sounds good, and I think the only difference is that note there, in case in which we'll take this whole thing, and I've lost the note, smart. <laughs> so it's somewhere around here, we move it very quick. Can I, can I hold shift and, oh uh, no, I, shift duplicates, control L, yeah, no, no, it still moves. Oh, okay, but no, it doesn't work. No. Yeah, I know. Maybe in, in your, but at least it it frees them to death. Um, <laughs> let me just select them. Leave them here. Um, in fact, leave them here. And I press something, and again, it went off the grid. Just, um, uh, we copy this part, copy, paste, I've created a new um, version of this because, let's face it, the only difference between this and this is that the fact that this one is a, has a higher note. So, okay, sounds good. But the problem is we cook too much uh, for this pattern. So we restrict its length so that when it plays back, uh, you know, even as, even as a pattern, it, it plays back from the beginning in a loop fashion. And now I can just take this and drop, drop it on my, okay. don't be, uh, okay, and I just, I can paint it, you know, I can have an entire song written with just this, uh, this thing. Um, let's put the kick. I don't like this kick. This one sounds decent, so we're just gonna, um, you know, create the kicks. We have already the kick here, and just let's paint the kick. Let's zoom, zoom this in. Usually when you're done, uh, programming your synthesizers and you kind of know what your instrument are, you'd want to work with this in full in full window. Um, obviously this is uh, 720p, so it's a very uh, 
it's a very small um, uh, space on the screen, but uh, usually uh, you would well, you would want to work on a very very big screen, uh, even a wide one, 49 inch, whatever, um, 4K resolution doesn't matter. Um, obviously, having more um, you know more visual space, um, it's it's an advantage. Um, I would want to stop the track here. And now if we play uh, these, one second, I have to snooze this, and I'm just going to have to wet my throat, we're going to see some problems. Well, maybe because the way the baseline is, you don't see a problem here, but Let's imagine we would have a, a baseline that is more continuous. Um, so let's put that off and let's create a continuous baseline. Um, maybe the wasp again will do its magic. Um, what I'm going to do with the wasp, uh, do I have one already created? Right. Ah, the right is very... Okay, don't, don't, don't do this now. Okay, please don't crash now. Uh, remember, save often, <laughs> you will see here. Okay. Hey, it felt video. They're not nice. Uh, we're going to use the three orc, and that's going to be our synthesizer. Maybe, yeah, maybe we're going to create the baseline there. Very basic baseline. Um, I know how we can potentially make it uh, more. And let's assume we have a synth wave track that we want to use uh, this baseline on because let's not waste too much time on uh, using the right sound. Um, I'm going to go on the baseline. I will essentially mute this one, and I'm going to I'm going to see where my when I, I'm playing actually on the keyboards. The C letter, which would uh, be actually E note, the E note, but one octave lower. And I put this sort of onto the, we have short space, it's very hard to see what I did. Um, you can look here, yeah, you can see, um, there's a missing part, right? So if I would play here, it would kind of play, stop, play, stop. And I want a continuous baseline because I want to uh, show you what problems you will face when doing uh, this. Okay, I haven't uh, enabled this. It sounds like a kick with a continuous baseline. It doesn't have, uh, you know, it doesn't have uh, a rhythm. It doesn't have anything. In fact, it it has a lot of problems because the kick is in the low frequency range. You would have the kick somewhere between the 200 uh, hertz and possibly as low as 20 hertz. Um, the kick essentially is a sweep in frequency from up to low. And then you have a bass line that is really low and they fight for the same frequency space. So what will happen if you do that, you will not be able to push the limits of uh, of the you know you'll not be able to push the volume let's say for now um, so that you get a loud enough track because you have this continuous sound uh, where's the kicks and please no that is in our case maybe it's not that big in intensity but imagine you also have um, maybe a stronger baseline. 
In fact, you know what? Let's introduce the mixer because it seems like we need we need the mixer. And I think the mixer is uh, no, 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 no. This one. Now the mixer. Um, what is the mixer? Can anyone tell me what the mixer is? Um, yeah, you have multiple sources of audio going into a mixer, and the mixer kind of blends them and spits one single stream of audio. This is what the mixer does in FL Studio. And how would you assign a certain instrument to a certain mixer channel or bus? Uh, it's really the FX number here. By default, everything you add goes on the master bus, which is this, yeah? Uh, but maybe I want to do something with this. It sounds, it sounds too open. I want to muffle it a bit, maybe distort it a bit. Um, so I don't want to send it directly into the master. Uh, I want to make him go through a mixer channel and on that channel, I will rack on some effects. Um, and I will assign it to channel number one. Uh, you can rename this and call it, you know, baseline. Um, so that, you know, you, um, what you're, you will often uh, get to as much as 40 channels. Uh, 40 mixel channels, and some of them will be, uh, this will be routed to five, five will be routed to three, uh, three will be routed to four, and uh, also 14 will be routed to three. So you can create all these complex patterns. By default, as you can see here, all channels are being routed to master. It's kind of an end-to-one relationship, but you can create more complex uh, mixer schemes. For instance, I have one going directly into the master, but maybe I want two to go not directly into the master. I want to go into baseline. And why would I want to do that? Why would I want to, why would I want to you know, anything I put here goes first through the baseline bus and then gets into the master? Well, think about it this way. Maybe uh, the baseline is not a baseline. Maybe you have multiple tracks. Maybe the baseline is composed of multiple layers. Now, in my case, I have just the three OSC. Uh, but what if uh, I create another, maybe even another, um, maybe even another, uh, even another plugin? Let's try the. T404 baseline synthesizer. Ah, this is a, it's a very hard one. Sustain. It's... No, this isn't what I think. I don't like the sound of it. Uh, you would always, you would most definitely want to rely on external plugins, VSTs. Which, by the way, if you get your hands on VSTs, they are actually DLLs, or they come with an installer, and they usually install in C program files, x86, Steinberg, VST plugins. And you would have to uh, tell FL Studio, hey, look in that folder for other plugins. Uh, that um, that I want to use, and you come here in this version, and you see it's exactly what I said. If I would open this, uh, maybe with a window shelf, uh, mm. <laughs> properties, I can only do this. Um, if I go there, uh, we will see that we already have. Uh, the folder of VST plugins, and I already have some plugins installed here, like the Oxford Limiter na Native and the Arts Acoustic Reverb. And let me show you um, if we add another plugin, how do you tell uh, FL Studio, hey, I've added another one? 
check one more time and uh, make it available for me. And it can be either a VSTI ca case in which it will show up here. Maybe you have a very super special synthesizer of your preference. Massive is very uh, is a very uh, used synthesizer. Um, what's the other? Uh, your, the theorem. Theorem is very. Sorry. Silent one. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, and obviously Nexus. Everybody knows Nexus, probably. Um, so those are uh, synthesizers that create um, richer sounds. So you can get away with just one synthesizer. You don't have to use many, use multiple synthesizers stacked up one on top of each other to create a complex sound. They will deliver that for you. And that's why uh, some, I mean, most of the artists will prefer a, a synthesizer that spits you know, the sound that you want directly by just programming it and not rely on stacking multiple um, multiple uh, synthesizers, which by the way is not a bad practice. And if you want a rich full sound, even if you have a very high-end synthesizer, you will want to stack up um, um, things for a richer sound. But this is already an advanced, um, you know, advanced uh, tip that will probably exercise some other time. So now I just want to uh, tell you how you will get uh, the plugin and what to do, what to, to actually do with the file to get it recognized in FL Studio. Um, so the VSDIs, uh, so the synthesizers will be will show up here, and uh, you know uh, they will be able to be added here and played. That's normal. Um, and the effects, uh, since the effects are something that get a sound as an input and spit out a sound as an output, in fact, it's not a sound, it's a stream of sound, um, they are rather elements that you will find in a mixer rack. And <clears throat> not sure if you remember or have seen, if you went to a party and there was a, I don't know, a DJ there or not a DJ or a sound system. Um, <clears throat> If you would look on, on, the, on the physical mixer, you would actually see a button with reverb, echo, and all those uh, nice stuff that um, you know people at the weddings are <laughs> using way too much. <laughs> um, so uh, FL Studio tries to mimic uh, the you know the, the physical design of such a synthesizer, allowing you to actually rack up multiple uh, effects. On a single channel, and let's say I I will use a delay here. No, thank God, no. I will use a uh, a graphic equalizer. Uh, actually, a parameter parametric equalizer, uh, which allows me to cut some of the baseline's higher frequencies. For instance, wait, not you, you. We know it goes through this because the related uh, mixed channel actually indicates that we have signal passing through it. Uh, and it means it also passes through this equalizer. But, you know, the actual uh, easier, easiest way to verify that is to, well, cut frequencies and see if it works. Right? So I'm going to cut until... I'm pretty happy with this. I'm going to add another one. Uh, of course, this is the very basic FFT-based uh, uh, param param parameter, uh, parametric bah, since, uh, <laughs> equalizer, and it, it doesn't have a very steep cut. So if you, if you wish to cut steeper into the frequencies, uh, you would uh, want to use something like Pro, key, Pro, how is it called, Andrew? The, the one that we both use, and I don't remember what the name of it. Uh, Pro EQ, something like that. Or EQ Pro, uh, well, it doesn't matter. For now, we will use this one which gives us a 
pretty decent baseline. And I will stack on top of this something that will, uh, you know, kind of give some some higher details. So let's clone this one. Let's uh, put it. Let's copy the pattern from here to here. And now that I've cut it, I can gently distort it with a fast distortion. Um, filter. You can see, you can hear the distortion happening. We have two types of distortion. I like the first one, but it really depends. The first one is more stable. And now I want to make the sound a bit more, you know, facial and maybe a, a bit more detuned. Uh, what I can do, I can really duplicate this and slightly detune it. Um, what I mean by that? Let's duplicate it, let's clone, take the same uh, sample, and you see here you have the channel panning. You can go left with the first one and completely right to the second one with, with the second one. And since they are identical in in terms of parameters, they will tend to sound the same. But don't re don't ever rely on this because sometimes synthesizers will not um, will not reset their uh, phase um, once you stop uh, playing. So they will not always start from zero when generating the waveform, and you will have you will have a situation where you think you've doubled a synthesizer. And the second one just uh, it's instead of zero starts at uh, 15 degrees, and you have a what is called a comp filter. It will sound it will sound very bad. You hear it? Let's uh, let's cut down a bit the the parametric the parametric uh, uh, equalizer. The thing is, um, this is already uh, a multi-frequency uh, um, sound. Let's reset everything, reset uh, here also, so that hopefully we get a cleaner sound, the most basic sound. And right now, if I detune this a little bit. You see in the top left, usually you'll see the value of the parameter you're actually changing. So by default, they are at zero. They are centered, they, they will not be off. Now let's play this. You hear the stereo and the fact that if we just mix them together, they will create a detuned effect. You hear that um, that phasing that uh, the sound has. You hear it now. If you go too far, it sounds scary. It doesn't sound like something you would use. And this is the effect I was talking about. When you think it's at zero, but it's not, there's a slight difference between them, and it sounds awful. Um, well, let's go back to the distorted version and uh, okay, pitch it up a bit. Okay, and now we play it with the kick. Where's the kick? It sounds terrible. They fight for the same frequencies and you can't hear clearly neither of them. So what you can do is to have a guy uh, standing here on each, uh, on each, uh, or standing here and do this from time to time. When the kick hits, <laughs> it will lower the sound so that it would make space for the kick. This is called side chaining. And it's usually hard to set up, but 
I've created a set of plugins. Uh, in fact, one plugin uh, that does that for you. And let me demonstrate um, that in a second. Until then, um, do you know a, a, a pad? I need a pad. Um, the citrus. And we'll take a pad from citrus and uh, demonstrate that. What am I doing? Presets, orchestral, above clouds was quite good. Okay. And if we if we play this with the um, with the kick, it doesn't feel like you know they connect. It doesn't feel like like they're um, they're actually blending into something. So let me show you how you actually install a plugin because. I think this is what we were doing. Uh, obviously, we've branched too much, but uh, I will take Future Sounds VSD bundle, uh, which is a folder which has, I think, no. Uh, no, I think, I think no. So, as you've just seen, I pasted it in the future, uh, in, in the FSD uh, plugins folder. If I look into it, you have a bunch of DLLs. Uh, I put a disclaimer that uh, in case your uh, uh, house burns because of my plugin, <laughs> I have nothing to do with it. And the, the, the graphical interface, you know, something to show you how it looks um, and what you would get uh, with it, essentially. So once I put this, uh, these uh, plugins in the VSD folder, I can go to, um, to FL Studio and say more. And he will show you the, the, the VSD uh, effects that he currently knows about. Um, and he says, please refresh if you install new plugins. Well, we call refresh. And you do a fast scan, so he will just look for the name, look for new files. Will not actually try to open them, run sound through them, and and do a final uh, uh, verification. And it says scan and verify is unsafe because of that. Uh, a lot of uh, since VSD is an open standard, you can create your own VSDs just like I did. So if I played bad in my VSD and my VSD would have a problem uh, by scanning with unsafe. Uh, you would probably crush your entire um, uh, project without without saving it. So the recommended is fast scan, and they will show up with bread. Um, audio plugin chainer is something. Um, it's a DX plugin with the what you're interested in, not the DX plugins, not the fruity effects plugins, but the VST plugins. And look at that, we have. Uh, my plugins plus uh, one called Melodyne Editor, which I'm not going to take. Um, and bam, you find them here. Easy as hell. And if you click one of these, right, you get the you get the side chain automatically on the track. So from now on, if I if I play. Let me create a track with um, the actual pads, just to give you an example. Uh, what's with and what's without the MP sidechain. Um, so, <clears throat> creating pads. Rename pads. And we're going to drop the pads here and try to do as best, our, our best to. Okay, I'm gonna record this a bit because I don't feel like we have time to. We're gonna have to do this at least four times, I think. Oh. 
All right, I think that's enough. Now we'll go, we'll uh, quickly quantize this amazing performance um, and make it a... No, and all we have to do now is to just you know extend this to the right uh, size, make them... You would, you would first want to start with uh, making them uh, the same size first, obviously. And uh, because when you select them, and you know, make them longer, uh, they will both they will all um, be changed in length, and it's an advantage if they are all starting with the same length. Obviously, um, I felt uh, a note was not good somewhere here, but I'm just gonna leave it here there. Um, don't feel like fixing it right now. And we are done. If you if we listen to this pattern, um, just the pattern. Yeah. Now I don't, I don't like this one. Okay, and now if I enable the amplify chain, it would count something like this. Wait, we didn't assign it to the right panel. You were not paying attention. <laughs> and we'll put, we'll make, we'll create a different uh, um, mixer channel called pads. And we will add the side chainer here. So this is the second side chainer. And without, Ah, remember this is routed to the second one, so <laughs> that's why you would want probably to route. Maybe the baseline has an effect that you would want to use also on the pads, and maybe maybe you want the pads to have some its own effect before actually being routed to to the baseline, um, um, you know, channel track. In our case, I will route uh, the pads to the master because. You know, baseline and pads are not really the same thing. Um, play it again. If you enable the empty side chain, yeah. And now, if you add the kick, it will uh, it will work perfectly because um, you know the side chain side chainer actually cuts you see it's like an inverted kick so it actually makes room when the kick hits the sound is uh, you know is essentially uh, dropped down to minus 15 decibels and if I disable this there's big no there what it is this is okay when probably if you have something like um, I don't know. At the end of of this thing, let me put this. Um, make it shorter first of all, so that sometimes when you produce uh, a dance track, you would have probably um, a pause in kicks. You know, something uh, somewhere, some some place where the kick doesn't hit. Let me show. You have an effect, and it starts again. You have a probably an effect there, and bam, start again. Well, that is a good region to actually turn off the the MP side chain. Like, and start again, right? So you ha you get a nice fill up uh, with um, with this. Um, 
what else should I show you or talk about? You have the, the basics. Um, until now, we've relied exclusively on samplers. And this is a sampler. It uses a sample. And, you know, you can change its shape, uh, cut, volume. We don't get into these details. But essentially, it's, for instance, if you have a single piano note recorded and you want to make, well, you want to make a score out of it, you can actually take the, the single piano note recorded and pitch it up and down to actually simulate a different note of that piano. Of course, that would be erroneous, but this is how music was made in the past. You would actually take a piano sound and do this to actually reach a different note. Um, now we don't, we no longer do this, but we still need the, the sampler for other reasons, like maybe if I want this kick uh, in the start of the track to, to start without the low part of the kick, like this. Maybe I'm preparing something, right? And as the track unfolds, as the track unfolds, and there's a pause and full kick, right? Um, a way to automate these, but usually you would use a small sound in length here. You would, you would not want to put a vocal here. Um, samplers are essentially like synthesizers that sample an audio clip. It's the equivalent, let's say, of an audio source in Unity, right? You can do things with it. Um, but uh, now we've relied on samplers. So we have a kick, which is a sampler. It samples this sample, which is actually a physical sample somewhere on the hard drive. We can change it if we want, yeah, with a different kick um, and obtaining, well, a different kick, essentially. Um, now let's take a super different kick. And he's uh, distorted. Big. Makes no sense to have it like this, but let's put a trancy. The trancy kicks are okay. Right, but then you have other types, a, a second type of audio that audio generator, if you wish, that you work with. And entering vocals. Um, I use vocals because typically um, you will use vocals as a big fat wave that you drop in your project. Um, it's true, if you have a PC that, you know, it's not that performant, you can save time because at least this is very expensive. Uh, I remember uh, me and my brother, uh, we had well, Pentium 75, which meant it worked at 75 megahertz. If you would put one of these and add another one, that's it, buffer on the run. You would hear click crackles and it would not sustain the, uh, the rendering. Essentially what the synthesizer does is rendering. Uh, rendering an audio in real time. It doesn't read uh, a sampler, a sample like the sampler does. That's why samplers are so much cheaper to use, but they don't have the, um, the power of a synthesizer, obviously. Um, so sometimes what you would do, you would uh, take one channel um, and record, pre-record it on disk and load it up as a rendered uh, frame. For instance, let's assume we did that already, and I have somewhere here a FT construction kit. It's called a construction kit. We're gonna have to change the BPM to match this, 135 apparently. Uh, loops, one shot stems. And let's assume we've rendered the baseline. Like this. Hey, stop. 
So now we have, there's no, it's not a sampler, it's an actual sample. As you can see, it, it misses those effects that a sampler would have, like uh, envelope, uh, frequency, filtering, and it's, this essentially is a mini wave player. That's it. Like we know, you double click and plays uh, a sound. And obviously you can duplicate the sound, you can do a lot of uh, things with it. You can cut it, you can paste it and do a lot of things. Let's hear how it sounds in the context of our track. It seems it's already side-chained. If we think it's not side-chained, let's go on a, on, a, on a channel track that we have a side-chain like the pads. You hear the side chain. So it's a good, um, you know, it's a good way to actually save yourself some CPU. And you get two things by pre-rendering tracks. Uh, first of all, you offload the CPU, right? Uh, and second, uh, most of the synthesizers. As I said, they don't reset their state properly when you start the song. And you would think, if I render my track a second time, I will get exactly the same output, right? Because everything here is predictive, is predictable. Uh, it's deterministic, let's say. Um, but in reality, uh, some synthesizers don't play nice, and they don't fully reset when starting the song. They start in random positions. And when you render your track second time and you add it, uh, you invert it and add it with the first one, you'll see a part where a synthesizer is just bleh. So it's not actually, uh, don't rely on the fact that a synthesizer will sound uh, the second time exactly the same. But if you pre-render them, they will sound exactly the same because, well, it's baked in content, right? And that's the second, um, the second uh, advantage you get. You get a steady and um, you get a steady re uh, result and a predictive, uh, predictable result. Because this seems to start the same, but I'm pretty sure if you render, if we render this and we uh, check against a second render, it will not be the same. Internal, it's internal, uh, let's say, uh, phases that uh, are used to create this complex uh, audio. Uh, they start at different positions, and that is, if your project is sensitive to uh, to one, how should I express this? If you want your project to be completely deterministic in terms of what you get after a render, you should uh, identify the synthesizers that are not playing nice and render them instead. You'll save yourself CPU with that and you'll have a predictable result. Um, so that's why uh, most of the times I will pre-render my baselines. Um, there's another reason for which, for, for which I pre-render my baseline. Um, for instance, if I take this, this is pretty high in frequency. I don't like it. Uh, drop lead. Sometimes you can you can actually change the pitch of, uh, of, of a sound and keep its length, that's very important. Uh, it's not like changing the playing note, case in which, you see, it just went longer. Um, no, I want to keep uh, the sound in length, exactly the same, but, you know, I just want to go three notes higher. For instance, let's assume this was just this long. Okay, um, I will create 
I will make it unique. Sorry for that. Um, and yeah, I, I did it the wrong way. The, <laughs> let's start from scratch. So what you would do, you would you would take this part. Okay, and another part here, and this part you want to go up or low or, or down. Uh, what you would do, you would say make unique, save, and now you have a different um, you have a different file actually loaded here. You see, it's part two versus base arp. So now part two sounds like part one because it was essentially created. Um, it was born from part one, so it would sound the same. But look what happens uh, when I when I uh, push it down. Let's see, four hundred cents. You get this, and uh, you can actually score an entire baseline with just one stem of, uh, let's say, of, of one bar. So I'll take this one, I'll put it here, then I'll go, you know, make unique again. Another part, probably part three, part three again, yes. Um, hmm, what do I want to do? Uh, maybe minus 20, uh, minus two, um, two notes. So let's see what we have. Now I think we need to do something like this. This one goes twice. So you will benefit from 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 actually changing the the time, well, the pitch of uh, of a sample. You would force FL Studio to use some sort of algorithm. Well, actually, it's really dark in here. Maybe we should. Because I will open a window and everybody will go, ah, blind. I, <laughs> the sun, I can't look at it. Maybe that's in that part of the, oh, perfect. Stop sleeping, you, you guys. I've been, I've been wasting, no, it's, it's fine. No, it's, it's fine like this. So hopefully now, woo, I feel fresh now. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, we have we have two, 20 more minutes, uh, case in uh, in which we will address some questions. I will just duplicate this and let's uh, call it a day. Uh, we'll remove this. Uh, you can delete the tracks that you need. Um, since this stops here, it will just loop. You can change the loop uh, point where to be. So where it, when it goes here, yeah, there's also this. So um, come again. You can change the, the looping point of the song so that when it gets to the end, it starts from here. Oh, come on, seriously. Something else in the mix. I don't think. <laughs> sure. Of course, it's this. Um, second attempt, a third attempt, a final attempt. It will come here, right? Right. So if you want to, you know, make an intro and then kind of leave the song loop, uh, you can do this. A lot of songs do that, but when you render, this is useless. It's, it renders once, it would not render endlessly. So usually I put this here. If I want to listen to a particular, um, you know, to a particular part of the project, I will select that part of the project and start from there. Right? It's, he, will, he, will, he will loop on that. Uh, so how do we make a track out of this? We already have a solid uh, bass line. We have a solid kick. Um, let's add some um, percussion. Uh, okay, 
hi hats and things like that. There's a sub base, but we will not uh, use a sub base. Um, Okay, and we'll start from here. I don't like the way it sounds, but you know, it's just for demonstration purposes. I strongly, strongly advise you to use Ah, uh, maybe because there's a shaker. Yes, the shaker is the one that does uh, that. Uh, I strongly recommend you use uh, the so-called construction kit that you will not see in FL Studio. FL Studio would come with some projects that you can open, but usually they are very complicated to understand. They have complex routing patterns and a lot of automation, and you will be just knocked out by the amount of information that you will get in the project. Um, if, you, if you're using a construction kit, what you'll get, you'll get some loops, you'll get some MIDI scores, so maybe if you don't like the synthesizer that was used to make, to make this baseline precisely, maybe you have your own uh, synthesizer, and, but you, you really like the melodies, let's say. You could, uh, you could get the paths, uh, you, 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 you could actually get the MIDI file and drop on your instrument. Uh, in fact, you know what, let's do this right now. Um, I have a lot of stuff here and we have these above clouds. I'll clone them because I don't want that thing to hear. Um, we have uh, the bass arp, no, the pads. If you drop the pads on an instrument, you have, if you, if you see here, it's the, the extension, is it visible? Like it's not visible. It's MIDI. It's actually MIDI file. Uh, but a MIDI file is just a a key performance, just like the one I've created here. It's a score. It it, it does it doesn't have a sound of its own unless you're using as an input to a synthesizer or a sampler or something that produces output based on a score. Um, so a lot of times construction kits will give you the rendered uh, the rendered version of the of the actual uh, midis and in our case the pads will sound like you see it already has a side chain <laughs> uh, but maybe I want to use uh, this way too loud thing and um, I want to use you know the performance the keyboard performance the MIDI performance of that so I'm gonna hey that's the wave don't do that um, we were using the MIDI and when you do that it opens you uh, because a MIDI is a multi-track uh, performance uh, it uh, kind of asks you which track um, usually it's the first one, or if you put all tracks, usually here the medias will have just one track, and case in which all tracks will mean, yeah, all one track. <laughs> uh, except, and guess what? Uh, we have the actual performance of, of whoever artist did this. Yeah, and if we listen to this, <clears throat> first of all, let's drop it in our... Yeah, oh, and it's really, really long, but not a problem. We can simply duplicate this and drop it here. Put the guy here, make it long, even long. Hey. All right, shaker. Uh, we have a start with percussion as well. Maybe we should have started with this instead of that. And we have the pads, um, case in which I'll just duplicate these so that it matches the length of the others. It's not a very good thing to do, but I, don't, I didn't like the fact that 
Anyway, so if we uh, listen to this, yeah, it follows the keys that we've just downloaded, but with a, with our own instrument, yeah. Now, if we choose a, a different preset, now we have above clouds. Let's choose something really different, maybe. Okay, this is way too weird. Alone in the dark. Dramatic. Okay, they, they seem to have more than one note. So I'm going to stick with uh, something. You see? It's different, but they follow the same keys. Well, to be honest, I, I liked I liked more the above clouds. Let's see how clouds two sound. Nah, we'll go with the first above clouds. Okay, and let's put on it, um, let's make sure it's on the right channel, case in which it's channel two, it has a sidechain, maybe we give it a little more sidechain than just, this is without sidechain. And it blends better in the mix. Um, okay, Jesus Christ, just <laughs> okay. I think it, it starts way too early, and the shaker. Obviously, the baseline is not on the same key, so it doesn't sound good. Uh, case in which I'm going to have to drop uh, what we've done here for uh, demonstration purposes and actually take the bass, the baseline ARP that uh, is used. So let's see. It kind of follows the the pattern of and there was another part here um, we can duplicate this again and you you're gonna do this a lot uh, duplicate go next duplicate go next um, so we were here I think it just repeats the same pattern. It's stupid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's exactly the same. So if you just double this, it would be the same. Um, yeah, so we've learned how to add a MIDI uh, performance, one that maybe you will get from somewhere. Uh, but I strongly suggest you leave the MIDI in the beginning and actually use the pre-rendered loops and play with them. Just drop them here and try to make something. And when you reach that point where you think you're good enough, with uh, you have an idea of how you know uh, a, a track is composed, and you have a, a good idea of how a specific genre or style starts and evolves, finishes, and you you get pretty good with uh, with with actually putting things on the playlist, cutting things, pasting, putting, stretching, up and down, changing pitch. 
uh, and you've experimented a lot with a lot of, um, let's say, um, plugins, effects, you already know a lot of synthesizers, you know how you buy uh, or maybe get for free, um, um, you know, uh, preset packs, just drop the preset packs and bam, you have a lot more presets, maybe they're made of, a, made, made by a big artist, um, who knows, uh, there are a lot of tons of preset, what's, uh, Andrew, what, uh, what, what is your preset? Uh, called, I think, speak louder, please. Two. two. One is three. And, and the free one contains what? So, you see, there are artists who actually create presets and because they know how to program these synthesizers. Uh, but maybe you don't know how to program these. Maybe you, you get a preset for some from someone and you made your make your own tweaks, and you get the MIDI from someone else. But there will be a point when when you'll actually have to create your own MIDI score. Um, you know, do your own um, uh, mixer routing. Uh, Tune your own effects, create your own chains of effects, and do all your stuff. When you hit that point, it means you know you're kind of production ready, uh, and you're ready to go to the next level, which is audio mastering, uh, a thing that will not address in this uh, in this uh, episode because we are four minutes left, and I'd rather you know take some questions from the. From anyone, really? Do, do we have someone on stream or they just? Oh, I know Radu. Hi, Radu. It was earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good one, Radu. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this when we'll meet, <laughs> my friend. Um, let me enjoy you with something else, um, just to give you an idea of, uh, oh, come on, decoding everything. Um, what the, the power of reverb. Um, we have here the performance of Madonna um, Frozen. And it's assigned to track, to mix a track number one, which um, is called vocals. And it sends audio, let's make this a little bigger. It sends the audio to one of the parallel buses that Unity, uh, that, Unity that FL Studio has. And here on this bus, I've dropped the awesome and amazing Arts Acoustic Reverb. Why is it so amazing? is because it's a modulation reverb. What that means is that instead of taking the sound, and reverb essentially is a, uh, a multi-tap delay. You know, it, and it usually does that programmatically, and between the taps, you'll have a constant uh, time. And because of that constant time, it will create some sort of a metallic uh, noise, some sort of a ring. A ring uh, noisy metallic thing uh, this this reverb actually modulates the sound so instead of using the same sound it pitches up and down slightly so that when it adds up with the other one it sounds sweeter it sounds uh, it doesn't sound metallic at all uh, in fact i've i've researched myself and got this reverb when i was uh, engineering the vocals for the Come To Me track, the one that I signed with Armin van Buren. Uh, I've listened to them on my headphones, and it, the, the vocals sounded great, but then I moved on something else. Uh, I had a you know, five plus one thing in the room, and I, I told myself, this sounds metallic. I, I, I cannot release this. It's, it sounds very metallic. And what do I want? I want a reverb that, you know, fights that metallicity. And I found this one and it was just, I was like, oh my God, it sounds amazing. And uh, let's, uh, let's hit it. 
Um, so Madonna sounds like this. Okay, it already has the reverb. So it's raw. Right, and now if we add the reverb, if we enable the reverb, and you know, kind of push it a bit. I don't know about you, but I think it sounds amazing. It just sounds really good. You're so consumed with how much you get. You waste your time. And that is the power of reverb. You, you don't hear that metallicity, that ringing audio that you would get with a traditional reverb. And uh, that was it for today. I think, um, let me see if we covered everything here. The VSD, well, we kind of talked about this. You can read it from here. A sample, well, an audio file, a mixer, you already know what a mixer is. Uh, MIDI, you can read all about MIDI's here and the patterns. Uh, we didn't uh, create an automation clip. And uh, let me just do that really, really, really quick. Um, so let's assume we add a synthesizer again. Uh, I'm, I'm reserved about that. <laughs> I'm, I will, I will, I will let you know when the time will be right. So let's assume we have this, and uh, let me very, 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 very fast create something that is a bit more than just a juju. So let's assume we have uh, a kind of performance. I will do it, but throughout the entire song, I want this to kind of start from here and slowly grow and not to mention I want those bloody reverbs to be on it uh, where are you so hard when you so this are you sh yeah no it's it goes here Come on, man, don't do this to me now. Yes, port. So it's still on this. Andrew, help me now. <laughs> How do I make this guy's channel to show up? Because I, I don't... Yeah. Oh, dear God, there's another one. Okay, we have this one. We'll work with this one. Um, so we want... As the sound played, as the, as the track plays. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to select the part where I'm interested in animating this parameter. And this works on anything, uh, from uh, synthesizers to effects. Every, almost everything here is uh, is automatable or an, animatable. So I'm going to start like this. Yeah. Maybe modulated a little bit. All right, and simply you select the part where your animation clip want when you want to where you want to drop your animation clip, and you go right click, create automation clip, and you have it like this. If you play the song, and Presumably, you have something playing, you hear nothing because, well, it's at zero, right? So you have to animate it. And you have a lot of functions here. Uh, you can make it a double curve and start gently and uh, get uh, more abruptly. Um, you can even uh, create internal points. You can stretch it in and out and delete. I don't want this. Uh, single curve and don't start from zero and 
watch watch this guy he he uh, updates in real time right giving you a glimpse of what it would be if he would play and even if you when you move the cursor he moves so he's being updated in real time right so let's try it one more time let's uh, go from here something went wrong with this guy he doesn't spit audio I think it's definitely wrong with this version of Google Studio. Um, oh, all clips. Wasp be wasp. Why are you not listening to me? Okay. Um, piano roll. No, I don't want piano roll. I want the. Oh, freaking. So I hope, yeah. And so when we play, you see, we can animate this. So I think that you would have maybe uh, I don't know a MIDI on on this. Uh, let's put the. Bass, arp, no, the pad, sub bass, intro, melody, drop melody, whatever. So, uh, we are gonna put the pattern, pattern number one here, enable the pattern and make this start and uh, in the middle it will be max and then it will fade. Go. You can see it, it goes automatically. Right? This is the basis of the basic of actually creating music. Use any oscillator, use any animator to create your art. So just as I've animated this, I could have animated anything else. Uh, I could have even when uh, go to you know to the reverb and animate uh, some parameter here maybe the dry effect or the wet effect or the length or the whatever anything is automatable and i saw even this is automatable which is insane but <laughs> it is so now i'm really done <laughs> <laughs> Oh, seven likes. Eight likes, because I also... <laughs> nine likes. <laughs> okay. Uh, I hope you will venture into actually downloading FL Studio. Uh, <laughs> crack, it, crack the shit out of it. And uh, go to KVR Studio, kvraudio.com. You'll find a tons of it, VST plugins. So that's a very good starting point to get uh, your plugins coming. There's a lot of plugins that are renowned as being really good and basically free. So uh, now that you know how to automate things, uh, use the MIDI to control synthesizers, you have the idea of how to put uh, and mix stuff. Uh, go and be creative. <laughs> Do your own stuff. <laughs> Break the rules. If there's a, if there's a rule, just break it, you know, only like that you will be able to create maybe new things that other people just follow, like, okay, um, a trance track has to start with this, and then uh, it has a breakdown, and then it has, you know, screw that, start with a breakdown, and then, you know, do something else. Uh, make it crazy. Uh, maybe in a different, rather, if you're still there, maybe in, a di in another episode we will discuss about making music for game for gaming industry and it has a bit of connection with the f with the movie with a uh, music production for film for the movies it's fundamentally different than what we've learned here today in terms of composition well of course it uses the same basics of uh, production. You still automate things, you still do other stuff, but you will have to deal with a different type of instruments.
those are different type of instruments and they are really usually they're really hard to get because you have those large horns that apparently synthesizers are very bad at reproducing them um, and when I use horns in my productions and I usually use horns in uh, you know filmish kind of productions or uh, drum and bass uh, I actually use a real horn yeah I go somewhere I hear it mm, okay that's it you're mine right here reverb on it side chain it that's it that's a uh, thing uh, and but we'll we'll see how we'll, we'll create stabs those you know the type of uh, action music style, which is completely different than uh, you know a, dis a dance, an EDM track or a trance track, a house track. You you would actually do the same things when creating these genres. Uh, when when creating music film is well, it's a different thing. So we have to address it in a different uh, in a different well in a different episode. So thank you for your presence online and on site. Um, I, I'm genuinely happy we had, we had some people because last time when I presented something that, you know, maybe was a bit too complicated, <laughs> uh, my only, um, uh, companion <laughs> was Vasily <laughs> and I'm pretty sure he knows now how Unity renders the rendering pipeline and how to use the command buffers and camera events. Isn't that so? Yes, you just went. You just went home, and I gotta do this, man. I gotta do this. Let me hook into the Unity's rendering pipeline and do that shit. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. We're ten minutes uh, later, but you know we had five minutes of wait in the beginning, so I think it's only fair. Uh, if you close the stream, it's closed. It's not closed. Uh, goodbye, people on the stream, Radu. We'll talk about it. We're, we're not gonna. <laughs> and thank you for being here, Radu. And now it's closing.